Hello, my name is Rico Tabor and I'm an Associate Professor in the School of Chemistry. Uh, there I run a research group whose interests focus on colloids and nanomaterials and the purpose of this talk is to give you an introduction to what those things are, where you might find them in your daily lives and why they matter to us and our country um, and to put them in context of, of why we want to research them and what they hold uh, for the future. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. So the title of this talk is Colloids and Nanomaterials, Building Blocks of the Future, which sounds very grandiose, but let's look into this and see if it's true. See if all the hype around nanomaterials and the promises they offer can actually be realised. So nanomaterials, um, certainly the word implies it's a very new field, and you'll have heard of things like graphene and quantum dots um, as being very novel materials with the promise of, of great um, advances and changes for our society. Um, and some of this is being realised, um, things like liquid crystals for liquid crystal displays, um, nanomedicine and so forth, do hold great promise for offering the next generation of technologies to improve our lives. However, nanomaterials are not an entirely new field, and both antiquity and nature got there well before us. Um, this image is of the Lycurgus cup, which is an artefact that contains gold nanoparticles, and so depending whether it's um, lit in transmission, so lights passing through it, or reflection, the colour changes from green to red. Um, even before uh, unintentional nanotechnology, um, nature had us well beat, so this is a a highly magnified image of the foot of uh, a gecko and you can see these tiny little um, hairs allow it to stick to almost any surface um, and it's very specifically that structure which provides this set of properties. Similarly these are the the tiny wax crystals on the leaf of a, a lotus leaf um, which can shed water and in doing so uh, clean itself and even a simple candle soot is comprised of tiny particles, nanometer sized particles, that offer an extraordinarily fine and precise structure and make candle, foot, candle soot very uh, hydrophobic or water repellent. So nanomaterials have been around for a long time both in nature uh, and in human use. So what is a colloid? A colloid is put very simply one material dispersed in another. And that means that this set of materials is really united by their length scale rather than their properties. Um, uh, good examples are um, droplets, bubbles, particles, and, and small squishy things. So droplets and bubbles are obviously useful in systems like emulsions and foams. And so we see them naturally and we see them in formulated products. Um, particles appear in a whole host of technological applications, paints, uh, engine oil, um, powder coating, aerosols, they're all over the place. And it's very specifically their tiny size which renders their properties. Um, and I'll give you a demonstration in a second which uh, really emphasises this. I would like to think of colloid chemistry as the, the link between molecular chemistry, so the properties of molecules, the properties of atoms bonded together, and how that informs our understanding of chemistry, and bulk properties, so the things that we can measure or the things that we experience, like the sensation or the characteristics of a product that we can hold in our hand. Colloid chemistry sits somewhere between these two and links them together, um, but also renders a set of properties that are quite different. So let's have a look at why finely dividing something, increasing the surface area, matters so much. Let's try an experiment to demonstrate the power of surface area, so the power of colloidal systems. What I'm going to show you is um, a reaction between two materials um, that in bulk react very slowly, very weakly, or not at all, um, but in colloidal form are going to react really vigorously. Um, the two materials are silver nitrate, so this is simply powdered silver nitrate, it's very commonly used salt of silver. You might be familiar with its um, properties from other experiments. And I'm going to put a little bit into this crucible. It's just the end of a spatula here, so it's really quite a small amount. Now, my next material is powdered magnesium. Now, magnesium is a, a relatively reactive metal, but not absurdly so. Um, it's used in alloys to make things like um, 
wheels because it's very light and strong. Now, these two materials are powdered and you can see just about how much I've got there and I'm simply going to mix them together. Now, I'm going to do something counterintuitive, or at least I'm going to do something and the result is going to be counterintuitive. Got some water here, so I'm just going to put out a little bit of water into this Petri dish. Then I'm going to add a single drop of water to this mixture I have here. And hopefully the camera will be able to capture what happens. Okay, so that was pretty spectacular. And in a second, we're going to talk about what happened there. So this reaction relies on the two reagents being powdered. They have to be able to mix very intimately and you have to have a lot of surface area in order for this to even proceed. Now, counterintuitively, adding water causes the fire or the explosion. Why should this happen? Adding water does something fairly intuitive, which is it allows the silver nitrate to dissolve. Now, the magnesium is more reactive than the silver, and so uh, a redox process happens. The magnesium comes and steals the nitrate ions from the silver. And this process is really exothermic, which means it releases lots of heat. Now, that heat causes a couple of chemical processes to take place, it forms a couple of salts, the spare heat, however, can be used to ignite the magnesium, and that's what results in this very bright white flash. It's burning magnesium in air. And so the main product of this reaction, you can see the cloud in number five, is magnesium oxide, and it's totally harmless, thankfully. And of course, the other product, therefore, has to be elemental silver. If the magnesium became oxidized, the silver was reduced, and so you can see these black tracks are not scorch marks, but they're actually pure silver in nanoparticle form. Because they're nanoparticles, they're black because their surface area means they absorb lots of light. Colloids underpin a vast array of materials and technological applications of those materials that we experience and interact with in our daily lives. Um, typical examples might be ice cream, which is a really complicated colloid of um, supersaturated sugar solution with droplets of fat, ice crystals um, in it, all held together in a matrix around air bubbles, giving the extraordinary texture. Paints and uh, coating materials are invariably colloidal systems, particles dispersed in some kind of carrier matrix, which gives them their unique properties. Um, pearls are a very beautiful example of a solid in solid colloid, so they're tiny mineral particles dispersed in a um, a protonaceous matrix. Um, and even the liquid crystal in an LCD display, such as the one you're watching this talk on, um, is a really beautiful and elegant example of um, the power of colloid science. Even within our own bodies, um, our biological cells, because of the length scale, because they have so much surface area, um, are a colloidal system. The, the most uh, prototypical example of this is blood, where that surface area is absolutely vital in being able to absorb oxygen from the lungs and transport it around our body. So, given their ubiquity, you might uh, have figured out by this point that colloids, although you hadn't heard of them probably until this talk, actually underpin a vast proportion of uh, what goes on in our daily lives and also our economy. Really classic examples are the mining industry, which is basically the colloid production industry for Australia. Dig stuff out of the ground, grind it into fine particles, colloidal systems. So the processes they use to, to refine and separate those mineral particles from rock, things like froth flotation, leaching and solvent extraction, they're all pure colloid science. Agriculture also relies on colloid science in a slightly different way, so things like crop spraying, applying fertilisers, creating those tiny droplets um, to uh, deliver um, pesticides and nutrients, um, pure colloid science. Milk and dairy, milk is a classic colloid, it's um, fat droplets uh, stabilised by protein um, in, a, in a complicated liquid matrix. Um, it's a colloidal system and understanding it, understanding how to handle it is, is colloid science again. Our manufacturing industries, our energy, our growing and changing energy industry, um, and our healthcare industry uh, all rely on colloids as their primary um, source of materials, their primary uh, materials to understand. 
So my crude estimate is that in total, more than 25% of Australia's GDP relies directly on colloid science, um, and much more so uh, indirectly. So what we can take away from this is studying colloid science is good because colloid scientists get jobs. What kind of jobs might those be? Um, this is just a list of recent graduates from my group, um, both at undergraduate and postgrad level, um, and these are the companies they've ended up working for. So you can see a huge diversity from classic uh, academic institutions for, for people who wanted to continue their research, um, such as University of Cambridge, uh, Calgary, VIT Bhopal, um, all the way through to uh, highly chemically focused companies, so people like Axio um, and Star Pharma, who use chemistry as their core business, and through to places where you wouldn't necessarily think a colloid chemist would end up working, but um, quite a few chemists, because it's a very analytical discipline, end up working in consultancies of various types, um, and defence science and uh, technology are always looking for um, uh, chemists of various types. So um, there is a huge range of industries calling out for chemists because um, the analytical process that makes you a chemist turns out to be really valuable. Chemistry is a discipline of taking incomplete sets of information and deriving insight from them, learning from them. Um, so you'll have different measurements, you'll have different sets of data, and you have to essentially decode the puzzle and figure out um, an answer or a solution or a way forward. And that analytical skill set is incredibly valuable in problem solving across a huge range of disciplines. If you don't care about the money aspect and what job you're going to do at the end of it, but you just love the science, there are also great reasons to get involved with colloid science. Um, Here's a really beautiful example of how colloid science acts at really large scale. So this is French Island um, off the southeast of, of Melbourne. Um, and you can see as rainwater or fresh water from rivers and streams meets uh, the seawater in this delta around French Island, it deposits silt or alluviate. And this material is very rich in nutrients, um, organic material that's picked up along the way. Um, and depositing it here specifically um, creates this uh, very uh, remarkable environmental condition. The reason that happens is because the particles, the little tiny particles of, of silt and clay and organic material, um, are very stable in fresh water, but they become unstable when they meet uh, salt water from the sea. The salt ions basically um, disrupt the interactions between the particles, make them stick together, and then they sink and drop out um, as silt. This process, again, is pure colloid science, understanding how that works um, and how it corresponds to uh, transport of nutrients and uh, transport of organic material is a key to our understanding of um, our ecosystem. If you don't care about the environment, I hope you do, but if you uh, care more about um, having a refreshing beverage, then colloid science has got you covered here too. Um, bubbles bursting at the surface of liquid uh, are a beautiful example of how surface tension, so the energy con contained in liquids and liquid surfaces, um, can do extraordinary things. One of these things is when a bubble bursts at the surface of a liquid, it ejects a tiny droplet. You can see in this sequence of images here, and that tiny droplet um, carries with it the characteristics of the liquid, obviously. In the case of um, uh, a beverage, it carries the flavour and the scent molecules, and so that sensory experience of a, uh, a carbonated beverage um, relies entirely on this process, this uh, colloid science process. Potentially more importantly, in the ocean, um, when bubbles burst at the surface of the uh, surface of the ocean, so obviously air is entrained by waves when they break and crash, uh, creates lots of bubbles. When those bubbles burst, this process means that they eject a tiny water droplet, which is obviously salty water, and as it dries in the atmosphere, it forms a tiny salt crystal which can be whipped up into the atmosphere, and that is our atmospheric sunscreen. It's those tiny crystals of salt that actually stop a, a great proportion of UV radiation hitting the surface of the Earth. So we have colloid science to thank for the fact we're not all roasting. All right, we've talked about colloids, and I hope I've convinced you thus far that they're super important um, and you want to know more about them. What about nanomaterials? Well, I've got a bone to pick. A nanomaterial is really just a colloid with an advertising budget. This field emerged um, 20 years ago or so, uh, and it was basically reinventing colloid science with a bigger budget 
and fancier words, but nanomaterials are essentially colloids. They are one and the same. So everything I've told you thus far corresponds equally to nanomaterials and nanoscience. The prototypical nanomaterial is graphene, this single sheet of carbon atoms proposed to solve all of the world's problems. Will it? I don't know. Um, it hasn't so far, but it does have extraordinarily uh, diverse and important properties that might make it useful in a, a whole range of systems if we can just get it to behave itself. So we don't use graphene very much in my group. We do handle it, but it's very, very challenging to handle. And this is why it hasn't really realized those applications um, to the extent that one would hope. We use a, an oxidized version. So this is graphene oxide exactly the same material except it's got lots of these oxygen containing functionalities which make it polar and make it dissolvable or dispersible in water. That means we can handle it a lot more easily but it also means we can do things in, uh, in aqueous based systems such as use it to capture pollutants, um, use it to separate out um, toxic heavy metals from water, um, there are scientists at Monash and engineers turning this into membranes for ultrafiltration of water it can also be used to create capacitors, which are probably what's going to power the next generation of electrical devices, particularly electrical cars. Um, and I'm fairly convinced that this is the future um, and that in 20 years time, we're going to look back at uh, petrol and diesel cars in the same way we now look back at steam engines. Um, it's, you know, it's very much a, a technology of the past. Um, and the, the future is to use cleaner energy um, and smarter ways of, of utilizing and distributing energy. Um, in order to, uh, to power our society. And new materials, particularly high surface area materials, so colloidal materials, are key to being able to, to hold charge. The more surface area you have, the more charge you can contain within a, a given volume. And so um, this is key to the nanotechnological revolution and to cleaning up our energy. We've done a few other things with graphene and graphene oxide um, that are particularly relevant at the moment. Um, one of the things is to turn graphene oxide into tiny capsules. So these capsules are about 1 to 10 microns across, um, which is about uh, a tenth of the width of a human hair. So these are really tiny, um, invisible to the naked eye capsules. Um, and they contain oil inside their core. What we can do with the, those capsules is to gather up toxic molecules. And the one we, we've had great success with um, are these fluorinated molecules that are hitting the news at the moment. Um, you might have heard of this uh, phrase PFAS, which means per and polyfluorinated um, alkyl substances. And these materials are um, extremely prevalent in the environment. They're man-made materials. Um, they have extraordinary properties. But because they're man-made and they're very strongly held together by um, chemical bonds that aren't easily broken, nothing in nature will break them down. So microbial processes can't break them down in the environment, so they accumulate and they appear in all sorts of places you wouldn't expect them. One of those places is um, the soil being dug out of the Westgate Tunnel Project and a couple of other major infrastructure projects around Australia. So we've come up with a way to, um, to capture these materials safely and inside our tiny graphene oxide uh, capsules that you can then remove and dispose of. So we're hoping that um, these materials not only solve our energy problems, but can also help to solve our environmental problems as well. My first true love in colloid science was detergents, surfactants. Um, I find these absolutely extraordinary molecules. Um, this is a, a, an image of the ingredients list in uh, a bottle taken from my bathroom. Um, and you can see the first three ingredients uh, are water aqua, it's just fancy word for water, um, sodium laureth sulfate and cocamida propyl betaine. Now those are complicated sounding chemical names. Here are the structures of those two molecules. They're not too complicated, um, despite their complex names. And these are the two surfactants or detergents which um, form the basis of almost all modern liquid soaps. So shampoos, shower gels, um, liquid hand soap, all of the sanitizers and things we're using, they're almost all based on these two molecules. Now, that's good in some ways. They have excellent properties. And I'm going to show you um, in just a second how those properties manifest. But it's also bad because these materials are generally obtained from not sustainable sources. So from either petrochemical sources 
or from um, oil feedstocks that either compete with food or um, aren't very sustainable, things like palm oil. Um, now, the behaviour of these molecules relies on a very special process called self-assembly, which is where these detergent molecules can form structures, ordered structures, in water spontaneously on their own. All you need to do is add these molecules to water and they spontaneously form ordered structures that can break apart and reform in a dynamic fashion, but these structures give new properties to the fluids. Let's take a look at how that works. So let's see what happens when we take sodium laureth sulfate on the left here, which is one of those personal care detergents that we talked about, and add some salt to it. So we're literally just going to add concentrated salt solution to our detergent and see what happens. Now, I will tell you that no chemistry is going on here in the sense of no chemical bonds are being made or broken. But what you can see is, on adding the salt, the surfactant suddenly becomes very viscous and gels. Now, this happens because, much like our silt particles in the delta around French Island, the adding the salt allows the molecules to get much closer together, so close that they start to stick together using weak physical interactions. And this process allows structures to grow in the solution. These structures are called worm-like micelles, and they entangle, um, wrap around each other, and form this incredibly viscous, almost gelled, texture of the product. If we give it a vigorous shake you can see it's now almost a soft solid and it suddenly looks like uh, shower gel or liquid soap and all we did was add salt to our detergent. So you've seen the extraordinary things that just adding salt and surfactant together in water can achieve and this process, believe it or not, forms the basis for almost all formulated personal care products and cleaning products. So from the, the bleach that you clean your toilet with to the moisturiser you put on your face, your shower gel, your shampoo, they all contain this type of chemistry. Moreover than that, um, industrial processes from drilling and heat transfer fluids and even um, explosives all use these same sorts of materials and same processes to render the, the texture and the properties they need from their um, surfactant materials. But as we mentioned, these surfactants, these detergents, are often obtained from not sustainable feedstocks, petrochemicals and bad oils. We've come up recently with um, a new type of detergent that's obtained from much greener and more sustainable places. Um, things we can grow in Australia, so things like um, uh, sugar, ethylene glycols from cornstarch um, and uh, alkyl tails from oil seeds that don't compete with food. So things like um, canola. We grow loads of canola in Australia and we mostly turn it into biodiesel or we ship it overseas for it to be turned into biodiesel. We actually use very little of it on shore and so we would love if we could use this as the feedstock for making detergents that are biodegradable, sustainable and contribute to our economy. So that's a, a, a project that we've been quite successful in, um, working with local companies funded by, um, funded by them and the Australian government and utilising our national infrastructure, um, all of us working together. Without that kind of collaboration, these things are just not possible. Interestingly, to look at very small length scales, so to be able to interrogate our materials, at the levels at which these molecules unite together to give structure to the fluid, we need a very big machine. And the very big machines we use are um, the uh, ANSTO facilities at Lucas Heights in uh, outer Sydney and the Australian Synchrotron just across the road in Blackburn Road. And this is what the instruments typically we use um, look like. Uh, they look very complicated and there's a lot of machinery. Um, but you need that level of infrastructure to be able to look at the molecular and atomic scale of materials. And what that can tell us is how these molecules arrange and interact with one another to form the structures that give the properties to these um, fluids. Now, if we use these techniques to look at our um, fluids composed from detergents, specifically the viscous ones that form things like liquid soaps, what we find is if we look very closely at 
small length scales, we find they look like frankfurters, little cocktail sausages. But if we look at longer length scales, then these cocktail sausages are all connected together in a chain, and these chains at high concentrations entangle with one another. Now these chains are called worm-like micelles because they look a bit like worms, they're flexible. And when they tangle up, this adds that viscous property to the material because the chains can't get past each other quickly enough. And this set of properties is what underlies their use in things like liquid soaps and shower gels, but also drag reduction fluids, heat transfer fluids, and drilling materials. The last technique I'll tell you about is the atomic force microscope. This is an extraordinary beast, um, and we've got quite a few of these um, in different departments at Monash. Um, this allows us to look at incredibly tiny length scales and incredibly weak forces. So in the best set of circumstances, people can look at single atoms and single chemical bonds with the atomic force microscope. And this happens by uh, using a, a flexible cantilever with a very, very sharp tip. And it's the last few atoms on this tip that interact with our sample. And if I raster this over a surface, so I, I draw a square over a surface, then by the movement of that tip, I can determine the surface topology and also the forces acting between the tip and the surface. So if there's strong adhesion, if they're sticking together, or if they're pushing each other apart, that tells me something about the materials and the mechanics of the surface too. And you can use this technique to explore some really extraordinary systems. So it's very routine for us these days to be able to take images of single molecules. So these are individual DNA molecules. These are plasmid DNA. So you can see the coiled up ones are happy, healthy ones, and the stringy, spaghetti looking ones are unhappy ones. These ones have been damaged by a drug. We're looking at how the drug interacts with the DNA. We can look at the lipid bilayers that make up your human cells. Even though they're very soft and squishy, we can use this technique to look at them. We can look at all sorts of uh, nanomaterial and nanomedical systems. These are amyloid uh, protein fibers, very similar to the, the ones that um, are associated with a number of disease states. And of course, we can look at our favorite nanomaterials, in this case, graphene oxide, and see the single atom thick sheets. So you can see these tiny things that look like sheets of paper are one atom thick planes of, of carbon and oxygen lying on the surface. One remarkable application of this technique that we've used um, quite recently is to look at blood typing on single cells. So typically um, if you've had a blood test done they take quite a large amount of blood um, and they do lots of analyses which take a lot of time um, and require quite a lot of sample. With the AFM and the great sensitivity that this instrument has, we can decorate the surface of the cantilever, so the, the tip that probes the surface with antibodies, and then detect individual antigens on the surface of a single blood cell. So with one blood cell, we can tell you your blood type. We're now looking at whether we can use this same technique to detect disease states and uh, figure out a whole range of other testing protocols. I hope that's given you some insight into how colloid science and nanotechnology are intrinsically linked, um, what they can offer us, and how they manifest in our daily lives. Um, I suppose the important questions to finish up with um, are, should I study chemistry? Should I do that at Monash? Um, I hope uh, this talk and other talks will have convinced you that um, that's a really good idea, that chemists are very valuable to our society, it's a, a great program of study, and that particularly at Monash, um, we have some great offerings in the chemistry space. And I hope if you do chemistry and you take a chemistry undergrad that you'll consider um, coming and visiting me and potentially even joining us for a, a research project. We offer research projects from second year onwards, um, all the way through to honours and postgrads. Um, and you can come and figure out uh, some brilliant new science in the world of colloids and nanomaterials. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your open day experience.